Hi, everyone. So we finished up our section on <coughs> vector and tensor algebra, which I'm sure is extremely exciting to all of you. That stuff gets a little dry. Um, but it's, of course, important that we have a more abstract understanding of vector and tensor spaces when we start doing <coughs> continuum mechanics things and look at you know, principles of virtual work, and sometimes you look at the configuration space, so like the set of admissible states as a vector space, um, or at least the tangent space to it as a vector space, and you, when you start talking about the principle of virtual work. So that's a very much more abstract vector space than R3. <coughs> but, um, you know, so that's why it's important that we look at these things as something other than just math 220 sort of vector space. All right, so now we're going to move on to vector and tensor calculus. And the first subject is going to be differentiation. <clears throat> so this is differentiation of scalars, of scalar functions, vector functions, and tensor functions, both ones that are functions of time and ones that are scalar vector and tensor fields where you can take things like gradients. <coughs> so today we're going to talk only really about things that are functions of a single scalar variable, which you would typically identify with time, but maybe it could be a directional derivative or something along a curve instead. doesn't really matter. And we'll introduce a couple concepts that'll be important for establishing what the gradient is. <coughs> <clears throat> and what a vector field is, or a tensor field. But um, we'll actually establish the gradient and divergence and curl and all that <clears throat> fun stuff that gives us our balance laws in the, uh, the next class. The understanding or type of differentiation that's going to be most applicable to our work <clears throat> especially when we talk about the gradient, is the Frechet derivative. And so the distinction between <coughs> the Frechet derivative and the normal derivative that you're used to on, you know, functions of a, a real variable, uh, the distinction there really doesn't matter. But um, it does matter when you start talking about multi-dimensional spaces. Um, the Frechet derivative means that there is something like a gradient that exists, you know, so the the gradient of a, a scalar field would be a vector, <coughs> or the gradient of a vector field would be a tensor field. Um, and so it, it's stronger than there just being a directional derivative. It's saying that there is a linear function that, you know, maps directions to the appropriate derivative. But we'll get to that next time. But here we're going to establish what the Frechet derivative is. So given a function between two normed vector spaces, u and v, get this hair off the screen there. And this is not necessarily a linear function. It's just a function that's mapping a normed vector space to another one. It could be the same one. <coughs>
the function f is for shade differentiable at a point x if there is a bounded linear function. So we'll get to that in a second here. the point x in u <clears throat> if there exists a bounded linear function we'll call it a <clears throat> And the bounded uh, really only matters if the vector spaces are infinite dimensional. Um, <coughs> all linear functions on finite dimensional vector spaces are bounded. A in lin u v, that's not a very good L. Right, so A is a sort of tensor. <clears throat> Satisfying. The norm of F X plus H minus F of X minus A of H. <coughs> this is the norm in V. Over the norm of h, which is a vector in u. Well, this whole thing, it's going to be the limit of that as the magnitude of h goes to 0. If that limit is equal to scalar 0, <coughs> So in other words, as h gets small, the difference between f of x plus h and f of x becomes indistinguishable from some linear function acting on h. And so that checks out with your normal understanding in the scalar case. You know, if, if u and v are both r, <coughs> that's not a v. And of course, r is a vector space, since you can add <coughs> its... Uh, elements together and multiply them by scalars. So it's a vector space over itself as a scalar field. <coughs> then uh, this reduces to the usual notion of differentiation. of real valued functions of real numbers. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
if the dimension of u is greater than 1, then f is Frechet sure differentiable only if its directional derivatives exist in every direction and are compatible with it having a tensor defining the principal linear part of the change in f due to a change in x. And so what we mean by that is um, <coughs> fx plus h is equal to fx plus df dx evaluated at x acting on h plus little o absolute value, or magnitude rather, of h. So this here is a tensor. <coughs> In Right, so it's going to take h, which is a vector in u, and map it linearly to the principal linear part of, you know, this minus this um, in h. <clears throat> so what is little o of magnitude of h? It refers to the set of functions that approach 0, functions of h that approach 0 faster than h. So a function phi of h is little o h if the limit h going to 0 of phi h over magnitude of h <clears throat> is equal to 0. So, you know, if, if phi of h is linear in h, then we know that, uh, that that is not the case, that it's going to go to a constant value. But if phi of h is, say, quadratic in h, so that the top goes with the magnitude of h squared, then, you know, that will go to 0. So basically, the numerator has to go with a higher power of h than the denominator so that the limit doesn't blow up.
something that goes with, uh, say, the square root of. is definitely not. <coughs> All right, so we'll revisit this more when we go to do the gradient stuff. Um, but first, let's um, take a little step back to the differentiation of functions of a single scalar variable. Right, so the derivative of any scalar vector or tensor function, which we'll call phi, of a single scalar variable is going to go like this. So we'll denote that with a dot, phi dot of t is defined as d phi of t dt, which is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 <coughs> of phi t plus h minus phi t. And here we can just divide by h instead of absolute value of h, and we don't need to have the Frechet sense um, because we're talking about just a real variable. All right. So one thing that the textbook talks about is, you know, the... Um, the derivative of a scalar function like this, if phi is a scalar, then phi dot is a scalar. The same thing goes for if it's a vector or a tensor. But if phi is a position, then phi dot is a vector. Um, <clears throat> and I forget whether we've talked about Euclidean point space <clears throat> so I saw that in the textbook. I was like, hmm, I should probably go over that again just to, um, just to be sure. So we'll say if whoopsies. So we'll have to, uh, you know, establish what we mean <clears throat> by Euclidean point space, um, what points are, why points aren't vectors, and all that stuff. Um, 
So this will be a useful aside, um, particularly as we go next lesson into gradient. This will be a little prep for it. <clears throat> All right, so a Euclidean point space. is basically a vector space that has forgotten its origin. <clears throat> so three-dimensional Euclidean space, which is what we're going to be dealing with, is basically like R3, except that it doesn't know what its origin is. Or there is no natural origin. So there is no natural zero point or anything like that. <clears throat> Your room could be viewed as a Euclidean point space, right? There isn't really any natural zero in it. Um, there's just a three-dimensional bunch of points there. Um, mathematicians would call that an affine space, A-F-F-I-N-E. Darn, that's a fine space. <clears throat> At any rate, um, so, like, in your room, if you look at a point near you and a point somewhere else, those are just two points. But, you know, there is a vector from one to the other. Yeah, and you can think of that as a vector. You know, it's got, like, magnitude and direction in that sense. Um, a point doesn't really have magnitude and direction, but the offset between them does. So vectors are displacements from one point to the other in Euclidean space. So with a Euclidean point space, you can add a vector to a point to get another point, right? So that would be like a displacement from one point to the other. You can find the vector from point A to point B, and this would often be denoted as B minus A, where B and A are both points. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So you could subtract points in this sense. V would be equal to B minus A. <clears throat> and you can add together as many vectors as you want to get a resultant you know, total displacement. <clears throat>
But one thing that you can't do is add two points together because this notion makes no sense unless you pick an origin and the outcome depends on what origin you pick. Right, so an origin would make Euclidean space into a vector space. Right, so, so to see this, imagine that we have a two-dimensional Euclidean space and we're just kind of looking at a little bit of here. And we have like point A, point B over here. <clears throat> well, you know, the, the vector B, V equals B minus A, that's pretty well defined. as is the point B is equal to A plus V, right? So we can add a, um, ah, come on. We can add a vector to a point and get a point. Um, but we can't add A to B because let's say that we pick this to be the origin one well then, you know, vector B and vector A or that, so A plus B would be here. But if we picked the origin to be like here, well now this is A and this is B and A plus B is like so that's why you know <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense to talk about adding points together in Euclidean space um, until you pick an origin but even if you do pick an origin you gotta wonder why you're doing it because it's kinda screwy so vectors are the displacements between points or like you know, a velocity that you could have would be a vector, but a point is like a point, you know, it's, it's something different. And I think that's a reasonable illustration of the distinction between the two. Okay, so now that we've reminded ourselves of that, if x is a position function of a scalar variable in Euclidean space, then its time derivative, x dot, is a vector function. <clears throat> Hopefully in the sense that, uh, that this is something that I've introduced already. But if not, this will at least do.
This is related to, actually the same as, the distinction between a base manifold, which we'll call M, and its tangent space at a point X. A manifold being something that has dimension and locally looks like R N, you know, a, a real vector space, um, but does not globally have to be the same. So like the surface of a, a ball or something like that would be an example of a non-trivial manifold. Um, and we'll there again explain that a little more <coughs> detail right now, just so that it makes more sense in the next lecture. That's not very good, is it? So like a manifold M is a point space that has dimension, much like Euclidean space, um, but it's not a vector space. But at least locally, there are vectors, you know, directions that you can go to get to nearby points. So we can think of the tangent space at a point X as basically the vector space of admissible velocities that would keep you on whatever that manifold of interest is, or admissible, you know, virtual displacements or infinitesimal displacements, if you want to think of it as that. Put an admissible in before velocities there. Yeah, this is a pretty cool thing that you can do with these that you can't do with your paper notes, right? You can just. Of course, even with that nice feature, I think I still strongly prefer writing on paper and the chalkboard, but hey, you got to take the small victories you can get, right? <clears throat> All right, so the tangent space to m at a point x is denoted t sub x of m, like that. <coughs> In R3, um, or really Rn, the distinction between the underlying manifold, which happens to be a vector field in the case of Rn, <coughs> vector space rather, and its tangent space at a point, which is always a vector space, is not so important since the tangent space to Rn at any point is identifiable with Rn. We'll write that down so that it sounded like gibberish, and it'll probably look like gibberish too, but maybe less gibberishy. And then we'll give a concrete example of 
when the distinction matters. And it's tangent space at a point. <clears throat> so the tangent space is always a vector space. It's, um, you know, the set of you can think of it as the set of admissible velocities in a point. And if you're in anything that locally looks like Rn, then that's always going to be a vector space. Since the, uh, the tangent at any point x to r3 is just r3 itself for any x, <clears throat> which is just to say that, um, you know, if, if you have r3, as your space of points, so you've picked an origin, um, and all points are just described by the vector from the origin to the point. Well, the, the space of all displacements that you can have from a given point is also R3, and so the, the tangent to R3, you know, the, the set of admissible velocities or displacements or whatever you would want to think of it as, um, that's also equal to R3. If you ever deal with material interfaces, like bubbles and droplets and stuff where they can have curvature or, you know, make a bubble, um, you'll run into situations where the distinction becomes meaningful and important. All right, so we'll kind of draw a nice notional little, little picture for you that should make it start to make sense, you know. So this is like, uh, it's not a really complicated idea. 
it's simple enough to understand, um, but the math of it is complicated, but luckily we're not trying to do a lot of the math of curved surfaces in this class. Um, you'll run into it if you try to do applications of this in anything interesting. You know, everything is always about interfacial effects when you're trying to make new constitutive models or anything like that. So you'll rapidly go down the curvature rabbit hole, but at any rate, Say we want to model the motion of some process that is confined to the surface of a bubble, which we'll call B. You know, so it's like a, well, it's the two sphere, basically, just the surface of a ball. <clears throat> Maybe we're modeling some ants fighting each other that are crawling around on it. Oh, I guess it's 2020. The ants aren't fighting each other. They're, uh, they're bringing each other flowers or something, right? beach ball. And we'll call it B. All right, so we can draw our little beach ball here. Um, and just to kind of give an idea of the shape, we'll kind of draw some longitudes and latitudes. But, you know, a manifold doesn't necessarily need to have longitudes and latitudes. Um, so these are just for visualization purposes to show that we're looking at a three-dimensional ball here. All right, so let's say that we got a point x1. And a point x2. <clears throat> and when you're confined to the surface of this ball here, you're not looking up or down. Maybe you don't have any awareness of the rest of the space. You're on a two-dimensional object, um, but it certainly is not a two-dimensional object that is identifiable with R2. So, you know, in that case, this two-sphere is what this is is um, kind of the most easy to visualize, non-trivial example of a manifold, you know? So it's got dimension two, but it is not R2. Now locally, it looks a lot like R2. You know, if you zoom in really far, it'll look flat and it'll look like two-dimensional Euclidean space. All right, so let's look over, imagine we zoom in really far over on X1 here so that it looks really flat. Um, then there's a, a two-dimensional vector space, you know, the, the set of directions that you can go at x1. Um, and we can think of it, if you think of it being living in a larger three-dimensional space, then this would be like the plane that's, you know, tangent to the sphere at x1. But it doesn't actually require there being an outer space you know, like an extra dimension above the space that you're living in. It doesn't require that, but sometimes it's easier to visualize it that way. Um, so this two-dimensional vector space is T x1 of B, right? So there's like a, uh, you can come up with a basis for it. There's the uh, this way vector and the that way vector, maybe and they don't have to be orthonormal, but you could make them orthonormal. Um, and over here is the tangent space at x2 of b. And, you know, maybe it's got a, uh, a this way vector and a that way vector as a basis for it. <clears throat> 
Well, clearly, the, the beach ball is not a vector space, um, and it can't even be made into one by picking an origin. But both of its tangent spaces, if you think of those as the set of admissible velocities that you could have, well, those are two-dimensional vector spaces, right? You can have any linear combination of, of this way and that way, and it would be an admissible velocity. Um, but you couldn't, say, have a component coming out of or into <coughs> the beach ball here, because that would not be a direction that you could go. Um, it wouldn't, you know, keep you confined to the ball surface. So T, X1, B, and T, X2, B are both two-dimensional vector spaces. But they're not the same two-dimensional vector space. Yeah, you know, so it makes sense to talk about a velocity at x1 or a velocity at x2. You know, you could be going this way or you could be going this way. Um, but it doesn't make any sense, for instance, to say, well, what if we applied the velocity from x1 over at x2? Like, it, it doesn't mean anything. Even if you were to use your outer three-dimensional space <coughs> that we've put this beach ball in, um, you know, if you shifted the velocity at x1 over to x2 in the three-dimensional sense, well, geez, it'll have a component into or out of the ball, so it's not even admissible, let alone meaningful. Um, and if you were to think of, say, like taking it and trying to rotate it around the beach ball and have it in the plane, well, it would depend on how you rotated it to get there. So, you know, they're not, um, they're not compatible with each other in that sense. Um, even though they're the same dimension. It's just the tangent space at a point is the tangent space at a point. And if the manifold is not trivial, then, um, then that's it. Whereas if the underlying manifold is Euclidean space, then the tangent spaces at all points are identifiable with one another, um, and in fact, the same. All right, so... I saw the stuff on, you know, positions and their derivative being a vector at the beginning of that section in the textbook. So it seemed like as good a time as any to um, kind of talk about what we're talking about. Well, that's funny. Um, but, you know, the distinction between a Euclidean space and a that many dimensional vector space and the, the distinction between positions and velocities and where we're going to go with it and why it matters. Um, but now that we've done that, and you can kind of digest it for a couple days, um, we're going to go back to regular old Cartesian space, whose tangent space is a vector space. And in this case, we're talking about, you know, three-dimensional Euclidean space with a Cartesian coordinate frame. And so everything can be identified with R3, and we're going to pick a fixed orthonormal basis. Oops.
All right, then we can look at the time derivative of a vector function of a scalar variable like this. So we'll call it v dot of t is equal to right, and so that is you can use the chain rule on that v i dot v i plus v i e i dot. <clears throat> well, it's a fixed orthonormal basis, so EI dot is zero for all of the I's. And so it is equal to VI dot EI. <clears throat> Following the same logic, the derivative of a tensor function of a scalar variable is going to go like this. T dot is equal to Tij dot EI tensor product EJ, where T is equal to Tij EI tensor EJ. <coughs> the familiar product rule from, you know, calc 1 has several vector and tensor analogs. So we put a line over it for the dot to say that we're taking the time derivative of the whole thing that's got the over bar there. That is equal to f dot g plus f g dot <clears throat> so first um, the time derivative of u dot v is equal to the time derivative of u dot v plus u dot the time derivative of v time derivative of a scalar times a vector is equal to the time derivative of that scalar times the vector plus the scalar times the time derivative of the vector time derivative of the action of a tensor on a vector is equal to the time derivative of the tensor, which we've said is a tensor, acting on the vector, plus the tensor itself acting on the time derivative, <coughs> or really just the derivative. You know, this could be <coughs> a directional derivative or a derivative with respect to arc length if you're talking along a curve. And then... Um, the derivative of the cross product of two vectors is equal to the time derivative of the first cross the second plus the first cross the time derivative. 
of the second. Tensor product is going to go the same way. A scalar multiple of a tensor looks like this. What the? No. Get out of here. And the derivative of the product of two tensors is equal to t dot times s plus t times s dot. <coughs> All right. Let's prove the first one of those using index notation and the summation convention. So relative to a fixed orthonormal basis, we have this. <clears throat> is equal to u i e i <coughs> dot v j e j is equal to u i v j delta i j is equal to u i v i. All right, so we can take the time derivative of that. U i dot v i plus u i v i dot <coughs> like that. Well, those, this is the component form of the time derivative of u or the derivative of u dot v. And these are the components of u dot the derivative of v. So that goes back to <clears throat> u So that one's pretty easy to prove. Now let's look at the last one, the product of two tensors. Oopsies, that ought to be a T there. So let's differentiate it. So it equals the time derivative of the scalar components. Times those plus the scalar components. Times 
times the time derivative of that tensor basis. But of course, that tensor basis is fixed, so that whole thing is equal to 0, the tensor. So which is going to be ts all dot is equal to t i k s k j e i tensor e j. We can do the product rule on those scalar components, and that is equal to t i k time derivative. S K J plus T I K times that time derivative, put parentheses around it, E I tensor E J. <coughs> so that checks out. Suppose we have a non-vanishing, so it doesn't become a zero, tensor function of a scalar variable. Call that tensor A of t. And let's define a scalar function that is just equal to the magnitude of A. Phi t is equal to magnitude of a, which is equal to the square root of a interproducted with itself, so that phi squared is equal to a interproducted with itself. All right, well then the time derivative of phi squared is going to be 2 phi, phi dot by the chain rule. And the time derivative of A inner product did with itself is equal to the time derivative of A inner product did with A plus A inner product did with its time derivative, but the inner product is symmetric, so that is equal to uh, 2 a a dot like that okay so then we got 2 phi phi dot is equal to 2 a a dot let's kill off those twos and divide by phi so we know that phi is always non-zero since a is non-vanishing so the magnitude of A is non-vanishing, so we can divide through by it. Phi dot is equal to 
a over phi a dot. Oh boy, let's get those all in there, huh? Uh, and of course, phi is just the magnitude of a, so that is equal to, so let's write the whole thing out. Um, the time derivative of the magnitude of a is equal to a. Oh, and this should be a uh, inner product here. So it's a over its own magnitude inner producted with the time derivative of a. <clears throat> so that's how the time derivative of the magnitude of a varies in terms of a, a's time derivative and a's magnitude. Um, if f is an invertible tensor function, so this is another one, So f is always an invertible tensor, not that this function is invertible with respect to time, necessarily. Then the time derivative of f inverse, which is not necessarily the same, in fact, it is not the same as the inverse of the time derivative of f. In fact, if f is invertible, its time derivative does not necessarily need to be invertible. So that's why it's important to put the bar over the whole thing. Um, that is equal to minus f inverse f dot f inverse. And this one's a pretty easy one to show. Let's differentiate f inverse times f equaling the identity tensor. All right, so <clears throat> the derivative of the identity tensor is 0. So we got the time derivative of f inverse times f plus f inverse times the time derivative of f is equal to tensor 0. So then we can move this over to the right-hand side. All right, and f is invertible, so we can write multiply by f inverse. minus f inverse f dot. So that one wasn't too bad to show. All right. <clears throat> Where'd page 94 of my notes go? Oh, there we go. Switch the order of the two. Kind of need that, you know. All right. <clears throat> so there's another one in the textbook. Uh, in fact, it was the equation above the one that we just proved. The, that proof was in the textbook, and it was nice and easy. Uh, the one above it, they didn't give the proof to. So I figured it would be a nice little exercise for us to play with some index notation 
stuff so that you can get a good demo of it in class. So let's, uh, let's run through it here. So also for F invertible, uh, we have that the time derivative of F, of the determinant of F, is equal to the determinant of F times the trace of F dot F inverse. <coughs> All right, so this is going to be a good one to use index notation. Um, and it'll be somewhat applicable to, you know, just using this index notation and your epsilons and determinants and stuff will be applicable to <coughs> that homework problem that's due tomorrow involving the identity plus a skew symmetric tensor and showing that it's always invertible. But um, we have the determinant of f is equal to, and this is right out of the textbook, this identity, <clears throat> one sixth epsilon i j k epsilon p q r f i p f j q F <coughs> K R. All right, so we can take the time derivative of that, and of course the time derivative of the one sixth, the epsilons, those are all no time derivative. So it's really just the three F terms that are going to have non zero time derivative. And it'll just be, you know, the time derivative of each of those three times the other two. So that's going to be we'll put the dots in at the end. All right, so here the dot goes on the first one, here on the second, here on the third. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's leave that one that way for now and go to the other side of it, this determinant of F times that trace thing there. And we're going to work from both sides until we manipulate them into being the same expression. <clears throat> All right, so the determinant of F times the trace of F dot F inverse <clears throat> is equal to We'll leave the determinant of f out front for now. And then have our trace of, <clears throat> we're going to substitute in something that I'll write out a little bit, but there's an expression for the inverse in terms of the determinant and some epsilons. <coughs> <coughs> So this is going to be F I K dot. And then we're going to have, we're going to express F inverse K J in a neat little way that comes from the textbook. <clears throat> so this is going to be one half. 
times the reciprocal of the determinant of f, so just 1 over a scalar. And then <clears throat> I picked uh, this particular choice of indices because I wanted it to be kj. And then the lm and pq are because they weren't used yet. Tensor <clears throat> EJ. Now, this is because SIJ, the IJth component of S inverse, is equal to one half the determinant of S. Epsilon I K L Epsilon J M N <clears throat> S M K S N L from two nine three in the textbook. <clears throat> That was the section on the cofactor tensor. <laughs> <coughs> All right, well, since the trace is linear, the determinant, as a reminder, is not. Um, we can move all of these scalar bits here out of the trace so that it's just the trace of EI tensor EJ. And the trace of EI tensor EJ is just EI dot EJ, so we'll put that in the next step here. That is equal to, we have this determinant of f out front. We're going to factor out 1 over the determinant and the 1 half. And then we got epsilon klm. Epsilon J P Q F dot <coughs> I K F P L F Q M trace of E I tensor product E J All right, well, det F over det F is going to cancel out, so that is equal to 1 half <coughs> epsilon K L M epsilon J P Q F dot I K F P L F Q M E I dot EJ, which of course that just becomes multiplied by delta IJ. All right, so we can get rid of j and replace it with i and get rid of the delta ij.
All right, and now we want to switch some of our indices around to put it in a nicer looking form. So we're going to send KLM to PQR and IPQ to IJK. All right, and then of course we can, you know, swap the order of multiplication of any of these terms here because it is the indices and not the order that they appear in that bunch of product of scalars there that determines the whole row ordering matrix multiplication stuff. Uh, so we end up with... <clears throat> is equal to one half epsilon i j k epsilon p q r f dot i p f j q f <coughs> k r all right, that's a good spot to leave that one. And it's looking pretty close to the other side that we've been working with. Right, we have a one sixth in there and three terms that are looking pretty close with the exception that the F dot doesn't exactly appear where we want it. So let's go and imagine or rather investigate that now. So we had one sixth like that. <clears throat> That'll make your hand tired, huh? All right. Well, like we said before, the order of the terms appearing in this product of three doesn't matter because it is the indices that determine the order of, you know, row ordering and stuff for the matrix multiplication, if you want to think of it as that way. Um, <clears throat> so we have like F I P F J Q dot F K R. We can move those terms around. That is equal to F J Q dot F I P F K R. <clears throat> All right, so we also have um, Epsilon. I, J, K, Epsilon, P, Q, R, F dot, J, Q, F, I, P, F, K, R is equal to minus Epsilon, I, J, K, F dot I, whoopsies, don't need that other epsilon in there yet. Epsilon P Q 
qr f dot i q f j p f k r so what we did here <clears throat> is we switched this j and this i <coughs> which is an odd permutation we swapped things once so that's why it ends up negative because of the way that the epsilon i j k works All right, so then we're going to end up swapping the P and the Q also. So you multiply through by another negative one. All right, so the same logic. So this was showing that we, uh, <coughs> you know, that that uh, this term here is the same as that term. You know, so that like this whole thing is just twice that. We're going to show, you know, the same logic holds for that. So here, instead of swapping i and j, you'll swap i and k. And instead of p and q, it'll be p and r. So now you can add those all together and you get three. Right, and so that is equal to one half. And that's equal to the expression that we found for the other side. So now, now we've proven <coughs> that it is in fact the case that the time derivative of the determinant or rather the derivative of the determinant for a, an invertible tensor function of a scalar variable obeys this. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, I think um, it's good to go through exercises like these. Um, kind of shows you how to do the homework. 
Um, it's really through going through the exercises that you figure it all out. But um, the flip side of it is that, you know, doing them in the lectures kind of takes a lot of time in the lectures. Um, so, you know, it's up to you guys. I'll maybe put a little discussion thing on the Canvas page and we can figure out what we want to do. But I'm interested to see whether you guys would rather just, you know, because this stuff's going to be sticking pretty closely to the textbook. So I'm not sure if it would be better for you folks to to read the textbook and have the lectures be more me running through some examples or adding stuff to it and really not running through the exposition of the textbook. Um, or if you like me kind of running through the textbook's exposition of things, just sort of adding a little bit here and there. Um, I probably can't really keep doing big examples in class. Uh, only in as much as, well, not if I keep running through the textbook stuff in, you know, if I actually walk you through the chapters, um, we'll just run out of time because we need to cover this stuff. So you guys can kind of think about what you prefer and uh, comment on that in the discussion that I'm going to to put up. But basically, think about whether you want me to kind of expose the material of the chapter in the lectures, or if you'd rather me assume that you've read the chapter and kind of grasped it and just kind of set up some examples and walk through them, maybe add some stuff about, you know, virtual work and some other things. All right, we have one more quick... Uh, identity to get through in this lecture, and then we'll be done. So if there is a tensor function of a scalar variable that gives an orthogonal tensor, you need the pencil. So that QQ transpose is equal to the identity. then there's going to be two tensors that are skew-symmetric and related to the derivative of Q. Q transpose Q dot and Q dot Q transpose are both skew-symmetric. To prove this, we can differentiate um, Q, Q transpose equals Q transpose Q equals the identity. All right, so looking at the first one, Q transpose Q, uh, we got <clears throat> Q transpose dot times Q plus Q transpose Q dot is equal to tensor zero. So then we have that... Uh, <clears throat> Q transpose Q dot is equal to minus Q dot transpose Q. Well, that is equal to minus Q transpose Q dot transpose which is to say that the left-hand side is equal to the opposite of its transpose, so Q transpose Q dot is skew.
And following the same logic, q dot q transpose is equal to minus q q dot transpose is equal to minus the transpose of that. So q dot q transpose is in skew v also. I could spell that a little better, huh? OK, <clears throat> the um, second homework is due tomorrow. Um, post the solutions to that pretty directly here after you uh, have to turn it in. We'll get a third homework coming out soon. And yeah, we're going to be cooking through stuff pretty quick coming up here. I think we'll probably have one, maybe two more lectures on differentiation one or two lectures on integration, and then we'll be into kinematics, which we'll spend some time on, um, looking at how things deform and what's strain and you know what's infinitesimal strain, all that stuff. And then we'll get into mechanical principles, and that'll be pretty good. All right, catch you later on. Have a good one.